Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's Saddleback webinar. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational. As usual, we are coming to you a few minutes early to help you get situated on GoToWebinar if you are new here. Um, if you're new here, uh, the primary thing you need to remember is you need to locate your control bar. That's this long, dark gray rectangle, and it's usually on the right-hand side of your web browser window. Two important buttons on that control bar that you need to be aware of. The first one is the question bar or the question button. Whenever you want to interact with us today, um, either ask a question, share a thought, respond to a prompt, uh, the way you do that is by clicking on that question mark and entering it, entering in whatever it is you need to say, and that's how you will be able to interact with us today. The second thing is your handouts and your certificate of attendance. Uh, there's a little icon there, it looks like a piece of paper. That's where you will find your certificate of attendance as well as your handouts. So those are the two important pieces uh, for interacting with us today and uh, learning your way around GoToWebinar. Additionally, we always love it and encourage you to follow us on social media. Here are the Twitter handles you need to know for today's session. We always have the Saddleback Twitter handle showing for these sessions, but we also always include the Twitter information for our guest speakers. And this week we have Louise Eliafori with us. You can find her at Diversify Ed Consulting. If you're not familiar with Diversify Ed or Louise, you definitely wanna go follow her on Twitter, check her out. While we're waiting for three o'clock Eastern time to, um, to come along, we'll officially, we'll officially start at three o'clock. Um, we encourage you to just go to Twitter, let everybody know that you are joining us today and uh, get comfortable, get situated. You can use uh, hashtag Saddleback Webinar. And with that, while you are getting settled in, let's say hi to Louise. How are you, Louise? Great, thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate being here. Thank you all as you're logging in. Um, be sure to follow those directions to make sure that you know where everything is and we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. For those of you who are uh, who, who join us on a regular basis, or if you're new here, a great way to practice interacting and communicating with us is by going to that question area and letting us know where you're joining us from today. I'm gonna actually pop open that question area here and uh, see what people are saying. Oh, we have a quiet group so far today. Uh, go ahead to the question area and let us know where you're joining us from. Say hello. Nancy from El Paso. Thank you, Nancy. Angie Alvarez. Thank you. Nice to see you. It's always nice to see where everybody's joining us from, and this definitely gives people an opportunity to practice communicating with us. So, Molly from Birmingham, Virginia Beach. Um, hi, Melanie. Melanie from Region 11 joining us. Glad to see you. Uh, we have uh, Iowa, Virginia, Canada. I was just saying, we always have uh, um, a devoted group of Canadian attendees. So we have someone joining us from BC. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, hello. Georgia, San Antonio, um, nearby to me, San Antonio. Arlington, Virginia, Channel View, Texas, near Houston. We've got uh, Irving, Texas, near Dallas. We've got St. Louis, Missouri, hi. Chicago, um, Ohio, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, uh, from all over. From, uh, oh, hi, Cornelia. Uh, you know what, I know I can count on you every week, Cornelia. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have Richmond, Virginia. This is so fun. This is one of the best parts of my job is seeing everybody come together like this. We'll have two more minutes before we get started. Go ahead while you're waiting, uh, find us and follow us on Twitter. Let everybody know you are here. Colorado, Raleigh, Asheville. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. This is a really important topic, and I think you're really going. Hi, Toronto. Thank you for joining us, Claudia. Uh, a lot of people from Texas and North Carolina today. Nice. I think everybody's going to be really thrilled with this information, Louise. This is a really important topic, and uh, we had a lot of registrants, and, and people are really hungry for information. So 
uh, we're thrilled that you're here and that you're going to talk to us about this very important topic. And uh, we still have lots of people signing in. Hi, Twee, nice to see you again. All right, what do we got here? Um, Elsa, you're asking about certificates. The certificates are in your handout section. So let me go back here. And this is for anybody else who needs to know who's just signing on. In this control bar, you'll see, you'll have a control bar like this on the right-hand side of your web browser window. You wanna click on that icon that looks like a little piece of paper and your certificate will be in there. So you'll be able to find it. And we'll also send it out after the webinar as well in, in an email. All right. Okay, we have someone signing in from Oregon. Hello. Mm -hmm. All right, California. It is three o'clock Eastern time. So that means it is time to officially begin. Keep up the interaction, everybody. If you have a question or a thought that you want to share, go ahead to that question area and we will get to your questions uh, as soon as possible. So we are here today to talk about mitigating trauma in culturally and linguistically diverse settings. We know you come to us um, for um, great information and tools that you can take back and use with your students and in your communities and on your campuses. So we have with us today, Louise Eliafuri, who is so graciously joining us to share her wisdom on this topic. If you don't know Louise, um, you are in for a treat today because she uh, brings so much to the table and has so much great information to share with you. Let me tell you a little bit about her. So Louise Eliafuri is a recent arriver and cultural competency consultant at Diversify Ed Consulting, working with refugee and immigrant serving organizations in the US and abroad. She is author of The Newcomer Student, The Newcomer Field Book, and an upcoming publication with ASCD around the theme of culturally sensitive trauma. She has also written for various print and curriculum publications, including EL Magazine, Edutopia, Europe in Discourse, I'm Your Neighbor Books, EduSkills, and Chalkbeat National. She works closely with schools to develop asset-based and action-oriented EL programming with a focus on diversity and trauma-informed practices that supports the socioacademic success of newcomers and English learners and their families. She also serves a range of organizations around workplace inclusion, bias training, adult programming, and curriculum design. She's an award-winning educator. Uh, she was awarded as Rodell Exemplary Educator, Distinguished Teacher in Denver Public Schools, Mile High Teacher, and Professional Fulbright Educator to Tanzania, where she founded a school that continues to graduate students each year. I could go on and on, but I think you get the picture. Uh, Louise, thank you so much for being here, sharing your wisdom and experience and information with us. We are very, very grateful. Let me go ahead and exit out of this and we'll give screen control over to you so you can begin. Just one second here. All right, you should be getting a message that you are taking over screen control. And here we are. All right, great. Fantastic. Liz, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's really a joy and a treat to be here with all of you and to take part in, gosh, this great afternoon with everyone. It's been a season. Um, we are going to get into some tools that can help you, perhaps with your students, right now or as you start the new year in the traditional classroom, in the online classroom. Um, Here's how we're going to start this today. When I work with teachers, I always like to model what it is that I anticipate that teachers will do or what I'm expecting teachers to do. So I will be using the Pear Deck add-on for Google Classroom through this. You don't have to take part. If you are familiar with Pear Deck, you can go ahead and jump in there. You'll know what to do right away. If you are new, um, you are welcome to try joining this with us. Certainly no obligation. Um, you may open up a separate tab on your computer. You may follow along with us on our phone. This will give us a little bit more of an interactive experience and some of the strategies we will be using, we will work through in Pear Deck so that you can also see what that looks like in the virtual classroom context. So again, this won't change what your, um, let's see, I'm getting out of here. 
loading in there, what your slide presentation will look like. So here is your login. If you choose to join us, I'll leave this here for about another minute or so. Um, and then that code will still be avail available to you as we move throughout. So again, we're looking at mitigating trauma in culturally and linguistically diverse populations. I'm struggling to get in there today. Let's see here. No, no. Let's see, we're having some issues with the internet, it looks like. Let's see if we can get in there. The trials and tribulations of uh, mm -hmm. virtually teaching and presenting, right? Absolutely. For some reason, we're just thinking here. We're just thinking. All right. Well, we will do the best we can to get this going. And uh, if it doesn't work, we'll we'll just uh, pivot mm -hmm. and make sure that we get everything that we, that we need. just pop out of here there we go come on come on so um we'll just go ahead and and get moving along here and if it populates it populates and if it doesn't we'll just launch into our talk anyway um so again my name is louise eliafori um and my work is in working with schools and districts around diverse populations so much of what i do is working specifically with um esl and best practices but i also do a lot around trauma and shock and facilitating those really tricky race-based conversations around bias we're just going to x out of here and do this old-fashioned way let's see we're not loading up. Can you see me in here? All right, we'll yes, go ahead. And we can see you and we can see your presentation. I don't think Pear Deck is um, going to cooperate, but right on through, but we'll be able okay. to see this might look like in an interactive setting. If you okay. do have questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. A lot of what we'll talk about today, um, you can find is in our blog section. You can also find information about our upcoming either in-person um, PD sessions or our online courses here. So please do feel free to reach out. Uh, so here's the thing, I'm coming about this work from the lens of a classroom teacher, right? So um, here up in the upper right, this is a traditional classroom. And so in that context, I may have in a given year, uh, 20 students and 16 languages and eight religions. So a really diverse population. This is a refugee magnet school where I had the joy of teaching for about a decade. Um, here on the left are my students in Moragoro, Tanzania. And then here at the bottom are some students that I had the opportunity to work with inside of Lebanon. And so here's what stands out about all of this to me is that students are students and humans are humans and we're all working to negotiate stress in really pretty predictable ways. And so the toolbox that I'll introduce with you today is the same toolbox that I've used with each of these groups of students um, to help them be able to manage stress and to be able to create a trauma informed environment. We'll skip on past there. We've got three major goals today. We are going to create a foundation around transition shock. We are going to examine that intersectionality of trauma and culture. And then we're going to leave with a bank of tools and resources that we can use and put into action starting tomorrow. So here's that first piece. We're talking about transition shock. And so what do I mean when I talk about transition shock? You'll hear me lean into this term ahead of trauma because transition shock we can think of as this overarching umbrella that encompasses high levels of anxiety on that far end, right? Post-traumatic stress, trauma, of course, but it also encompasses culture shock. And so for those of us working with recent arrival or newcomer populations, that transition shock piece is really key. And so, of course, we know that transition shock can manifest in a variety of ways and have a lot of different outcomes for each individual student, um, whether those are developmental or emotional or physical or sociocultural. So we'll refer to this term transition shock as we move throughout the course today. In the classroom, 
what are we seeing, right? So here's what, what I notice most frequently in, in working with students. Uh, one is that physical pain. So students coming in every day, um, maybe from the playground or lunch or starting in the morning, hey, my elbow hurts, my knee hurts. Can you check this rash? I have a headache, can I see the nurse? Um, nausea, uh, speech impediments. We see sometimes extreme disorganization or on the other side of that, um, excessive tidiness, right? Um, sensory stimuli, boredom on that far side, we might see um, detachment issues like delinquency or defiance. Now, here's the thing I'd like to mention here. Um, all students experience stress, all humans experience stress. That's normative, it's natural, that's, that's part of what keeps us safe. So I'm not particularly concerned when I see two or three of these occurring at a time. Um, now, when an individual's ability to manage that stress becomes so overwhelmed, that's when we run into issues of transition shock, including trauma. In those cases, I might see five or six or seven of these uh, manifestations populate at a given time, or I may see two or three that are occurring on a daily basis. So when I'm seeing those, that's when some flags are going up and I may be taking some notes. I may be reaching out to uh, resources on deck at our school, like the school counselor for other support. Um, I may be starting the RTI referral process, but I'm certainly beginning some trauma-informed interventions. So here's how we're going to move through trauma. We want to create a framework that we can use throughout. So we're going to rely on four pillars. And so we'll look to these as we investigate all of our strategies. And those are connect, protect, respect, and redirect. So we're going to ground down in that maintaining authentic relationships, which we already know is so important. Protect is really critical at this moment in time with all that we have going on with our students. That that safety and trust. We know that students have difficulty learning when they don't feel safe. Um, respect that voice and choice and collaboration. And then finally, um, creating a system of sustainability so that students are able to redirect themselves as they run into um, challenges related to transition shock. So now we're gonna start uh, looking at how those two intersect, right? Trauma and culture. So we know the transition shock intersects with all kinds of other life features. Some of these came up in those questions that you had um, as you were registering. So I did see some pieces there related to historical trauma, that intergenerational trauma. In that case, uh, perhaps a student has not experienced an adverse experience directly, but is living in the home with a parent or grandparent that has lived through that trauma, right? And so they're having that overflow, they're living in that, in that context. And so that's that historical trauma. Race-based trauma is at the forefront of our thinking right now as well as it should be. Um, gender, how boys and girls or men and women are taught to express emotions. And then the social ramifications if they don't align with the social norms for that, right? location. So what resources and tools are available, um, how mental health is perceived in a given region, and closely related to that, the language piece. So in, in many of our cultures, say in Chin Burma, for example, there's no word that directly expresses um, mental health, much less um, breakdowns of that, like trauma. So we may have a very difficult time communicating our concerns or our uh, plans in, in working with a, a student around that area. But today we're going to focus on this culture piece. That's where we're rooting down into today, where transition shock intersects with that cultural piece. And so in order to do that, we've got to get down into what culture is. So we're going to take a, just a little detour so that we can understand what we're talking about when we say culture. So this is my onion of student identity, right? Students come into our schools, um, into our districts, and they check those tidy little boxes, black, white, Asian, and so on. Um, and that's that race bubble, right? So of course, that really doesn't give us any truly valuable information about who that student is. So uh, historically, of course, um, features of race are created to facilitate power hierarchies. They're not uh, indicative of who that student is. So those are external construct play, constructs placed upon another individual uh, based on their outward physical appearance. 
then we get down to this layer of ethnicity. And so ethnicity brings in the element of choice. Here, an individual can choose to align with their ethnicity or with features of language and nationality and heritage and culture. So that's the element of choice. Um, so again, race, that construct is placed upon you based upon outward physical appearance. Ethnicity um, is an internal construct. So ethnicity encompasses those other values, nationality, heritage, and culture. Just quickly on nationality, um, I'll make the point that nationality can certainly be the the area or the place that a student has a birth certificate or citizenship or was born. But because this is a student identity and it falls under ethnicity, which is choice, that element of nationality can also speak to a place that a person identifies with as home. And this was one of the questions also that came up in your pre-registration um, notes or curiosities. Those students say are dreamers, right? That may choose to align with the nationality that speaks most to them. Then we have that heritage piece. So heritage is, for most of us, a more detached concept. This has to do more with our ancestors. Um, and so for me, for example, my heritage is predominantly Irish, but I don't speak Gaelic. I don't um, know how to cook any kind of Irish foods. I don't understand the local, the local culture. So I'm detached from that. My own children, however, are very closely attached to their heritage on their dad's side. So we speak only Arabic at home. We prepare Lebanese foods frequently. We spend a significant amount of time in Lebanon. And so that heritage value is very strong for them. And then finally, we're down into this culture piece. And so with this, I want us to keep in mind that these terms are used interchangeably very frequently, and that creates some problems for us because they're obviously very different concepts, right? So we've made it down into this cultural bubble, and we're going to break that down even further. If you have not had a chance to visit the work of Zaretta Hammond or uh, Geneva Gay, who was really the, the founder of all of this great work around culturally responsive teaching and learning, I highly encourage you to do so. So we're in that cultural bubble. We're talking about our surface level culture right on top. So those are our observable pieces, the fashion and art and language and games. We move down a layer. And these are our explicitly taught ideas, right? So for our North and East African students, that may be eye contact. We have things like how you treat your elders or the concepts of time or personal space. Um, living in East Africa, for example, um, before a meeting, we would say, are we talking America time or are we talking Africa time? And that's never, uh, received or or put out there is an insult, right? It's it's a clarifying question because America time means nine o'clock means nine o'clock or perhaps even eight fifty five. Africa time means I'll leave my house, I'll talk to my neighbor, maybe I'll walk to the market with her while I'm there. I'll check out my dress and then I'll get there when I get there. Tomorrow's another day, right? So those those different concepts of space and time and gender norms. Mm -hmm. Finally, we move into this collective unconscious. So this is the worldview. And we've taken all this time to go from this top level of race all the way down to culture and down further into culture because this space of collective unconscious, this is where culturally responsive teaching and learning occurs. This is our area here. So everything we're gonna talk about today is going to be within this collective unconscious space. Here are some elements of that. Storytelling also came up in your um, pre-webinar questions. How can I embed storytelling as an element of trauma-informed care? That idea of saving face, so um, not wanting to share your thoughts or ideas and including right your emotional thoughts or ideas for fear of um, perhaps letting down the larger family name, that you are acting as a representative of that larger family name. Collectivist nature, just um, acting more as part of a group, that inclination to be a group rather than as an individual, which is how we approach things here in the West. Traditional recall devices like song and dance and mnemonic devices, and then that wander and explore, get out and do it, right? So you're already doing this in your classroom. You are already 
touching on and speaking to these culturally responsive pieces and here's how you're doing it and here's how you can do more. So um, things like cooperative structures really speak to that oral tradition, right? Inquiry and project-based learning really facilitate wonder and explore in your classroom. That collectivist nature, small group work or having class jobs, all of that helps to speak to that collectivist nature piece. So we take in now the trauma-informed piece and we have taken the culturally responsive piece and we are going to fit those together as we dig into our strategies, uh, which is where we'll spend the rest of our time together today. So here again are those four pillars, right? Connect, protect, respect, redirect. That's our trauma-informed instruction. And then we have our culturally responsive teaching, which is the place we're rooting down into. So this is our collective unconscious space. Now, when we get into each of our strategies, you'll see that the trauma-informed um, elements there are always going to be in the orange. Where that speaks to a student in a culturally responsive space will always be in green. And here's what I mean by that. Right, so we'll start with our non-negotiable five, and you can see that this touches on all four elements of that trauma-informed care. So it touches on connect and protect and respect and redirect. For culturally responsive teaching, we see that in collectivist nature and in wander and explore. So these are the non-negotiable five. If I walk into any school, any district, any classroom, here's what I'm seeking out. I'm looking for that calm, organized environment. I'm looking for adjusted sensory stimuli. So what I mean by that is that some students may need more stimuli, uh, some students need less. In a traditional classroom, I may be very cognizant of how much material is on my walls or how much I'm embedding um, the use of sound or uh, when lights are turned off and on abruptly or if there's loud noises coming down the hallway or construction going on. Um, routine and predictability. So routine and predictability create structure, structure creates Creates trust, trust creates safety, and safety is where students begin learning. Um, healthy collaboration within the classroom and those groups, right, but also with our teaching peers, and then those effective home partnerships. And when I mean teaching peers, I'm also talking here about our fabulous um, care workers in school, our school psychologists, our school counselors, our school nurses, so making sure that we have a healthy collaboration with all of those folks. Liz, let's stop for just a minute. Do we have any questions leading up to this before we jump into some strategies here? We don't have any specific questions right now, just people are loving the information and, and wanting more of it. So um, as you're listening to Louise, if you have questions that are popping into your mind, go ahead and enter those into the question area and we will get to those as soon as we can. But right now people are just very enthusiastic about, about the information, so I think we can keep going. Wonderful. I know this is a lot of content if we kind of just need to build that background, right? Just the same way we would do for our students. So we want to have that background intact for many of you. Um, you've heard this before or we're reminding or reviewing that information and for some of us it's brand new. So we're creating that structure and now we're ready to get into the strategies. So let's do exactly that. The first three strategies we'll talk about are all rooting aspects. So um, you'll see the same um, directives here for all three of those. So they all fall into protect, respect, and redirect. These all can be considered traditional memory devices or speak to the wander and explore component. So I love this one. This is my take along strategy that I can take with me into the library, to the zoo school field trip, um, in the classroom. Students, once they become really familiar with this one, I see them starting to use it on the playground or with one another. And it's pretty straightforward, right? It's easy to remember. So five things to look at. So that's pretty direct. Uh, computer, pencil, Miss Elia Fori, window, light. And then we move on to four things to touch, not your neighbor, right? Knee, elbow, desk, phone. Three things to listen to and so on. Of all of these, which is the most challenging one for our students? Right, it's always number one, isn't it? Um, those positive quality, 
qualities. So in a traditional classroom setting, what we'll do is sit together and call out those positive qualities as a whole group. And we will post those just the same way we would as any other anchor chart in our classroom so that when students get stuck here, they have that anchor to look at and say, I know this is my positive quality. In the virtual context, I've used a Padlet for this where there's a column for each student's name and we add to those positive qualities as we move throughout the year. So students then also have an anchor chart to look at. Um, and when students get down to that one, if they are reevaluating and say, hey, my stress level on a scale of one to 10 is still more than four, we roll right back to the beginning and start all over again. So this particular strategy I love for my earlier grades um, and also my very early English learners, although I certainly invite students to walk through this in their native language because this is not a language activity, this is a trauma-informed activity, right? Same exact concept, but this gives students a little bit more agency, and so it works better, I find, for my older students or students with a little bit more language capacity. And here's what I mean by that agency. So there's some choice here. Maybe a student chooses to count backwards by 10. Maybe they choose to walk in a circle three times, whatever that is for them. Then they're going to focus their orient on that thought and then come back to a self-check. Guess what? Same process. Still over a four, you just go back to the beginning and start again. Right? And so here's the last one in this rooting, and this is a circle of control. I've done this one also on a Google slide, um, and students can recreate this whenever they're at home and feeling that overwhelm come on. The first point is to write the name. There's something really grounding about writing something as familiar as one's own name. And then we move outside the circle, all those things going on that are outside of my control. You have got in an argument with a friend, what are all those things that you can't control about that? And then you bring it down into this last circle here, this number three, which are actionable steps. And so here's an example of that. Right here we are, we have COVID-19, there's protests going on. We have, true story, a flat tire in the middle of all this and we lost our electricity and we had a new baby. So I have a two month old and a two year old in the house. Um, there's a lot of, of, of overwhelm in that capacity, right? So here are my actionable steps. I can ask my friends what they're reading about race and equity. I can continue to educate myself because that's something I have control over. I can take the car to get fixed. I can FaceTime my dad. And and I tried to limit this to no more than five actionable steps. Really three is a great number to have. Just those actionable pieces that students can reclaim um, this perhaps negative um, experience and take that power back. So those are our three rooting exercises. Um, Storytelling, again, I saw come up in your comments and journaling is a great way to go about that. Um, if you have not visited Inner World Work UK, which you'll find here, um, they have tons of fabulous resources. And I really like these books for journaling because they walk students through what their body and their brain feel like in elements of flight or fight or freeze or submit, right? So that brain is fired up. We've got the amygdala and the hippocampus all fired up. And so we've got frontal lobe impacts there. Um, impacting things like memory and planning and self-regulation and organization. So these journals help students walk through that process and name those for themselves. This is the earlier grade version. And, uh, you can link to that here. This is the upper grade version. They also have some terrific resources. This would be a great page to translate for your parents at home. This was actually made for parents. I use it in the classroom, um, but it's also great for students as they start to notice those elements within themselves. They're feeling hyperactive or manicky or silly or aggressive. Hey, what they're saying is keep me close by. That's what they need to hear. And what can they do at home? They can eat some crunchy foods. They can have a cup of warm milk. Um, they can take some Actionable. They can try some deep breathing or they can do a familiar and easy chore. Those are things that they can start to self-regulate some of those um, behaviors, right? So journaling, again, is a great resource. These worry boxes would be really great right now, given all that we're going through. In a traditional classroom, we have a template that we use, which I'll share with you, uh, or an Altoid tin, and students write their worry 
on a little piece of paper and they put it into this worry box and they close the lid and that worry is captured in there. So um, that's done, that's done out of the thinking for now. So they can check back on that worry at the end of the day or for students who are very uh, just starting this process in an hour or at the end of a week and if that worry again on a scale of one to ten is still on the scale um, at the same or less than it was just keep it in the worry box it's okay if it's gone the worry is no more it doesn't doesn't register on the scale fantastic think about how you solve that problem and get rid of it tear it up crumple it up throw it in the trash can if that worry is bigger on the worry scale than it was now it's time to pass that worry on to your teacher and you'll see this speaks a lot to saving face right those students who are perhaps concerned to bring that worry to the forefront um, for fear of that of that um, speaking to the larger family name or the larger community. So in a traditional classroom, I have a physical worry box. In a virtual classroom, I've done this with a, a Dropbox and a Google folder that is set to private that those students can then turn those worries over to me if they would like to work on the worry together. Here are those templates that I use in the classroom. And here are some ways that you can go about that right in Padlet, right? If you have used Padlet, your um, own screen will prompt you to move this to a specific area. And we can also do larger checks, right, to see where those are. Now, if we were doing this in Padlet, I could view that and I can see where all of your responses are lining up. Um, if I'm seeing a lot appear in the orange and red, what that's telling me is my students aren't ready to learn right now. Right, so I can teach my little heart out, but if students are not able to be receptive to that information right now, um, it's really going to, going to be falling on deaf ears, right? So I need to perhaps work on a trauma mitigating strategy first so that we can move students more into that green area and be ready for learning. So it gives me some ideas about where my students as a whole are at. Blackout poetry. These two examples both came from Magical Miss Murphy. If you haven't found her on Twitter yet, she's fabulous. I would highly recommend um, tracking her down because she's got some great ideas um, for general instruction. So blackout poetry, how powerful are these, right? They think everything is fine, it's not. They talk, I'm glad, I don't care, I laugh, but everybody wants to belong I don't, it's too complicated, right? And so again, this speaks to the wander and explore, to saving face, to that oral tradition and storytelling, and it's hitting on those trauma-informed components. Now, I will make the disclaimer, I don't implement this as part of a poetry unit, and I don't, I'm not uh, analyzing this as a, an English lesson, right? So I'm setting up a safe space for working, I'm modeling this activity, um, and I'm offering up books in the traditional classroom. There's something so liberating about ripping a page out of a book, right? Um, and then the, the point here is to take some of that language load off of our um, language learners so that we can really um, look at that process of mitigating trauma. Again, not evaluating the language piece. So this is used again in a safe space as a calming tool to bring students, um, as Jim Sporletter in his talk says from this red where students are fired up into an orange or a yellow and down into a green where you can actually have some meaningful constructive conversation. There's a, a, several digital versions available for Blackout Poetry. This is one I'm loving right now. Um, it, there's a video how-to, there are template Google Slides and student examples. So if you're looking for a way to um, uh, incorporate Blackout Poetry in a digital way, this is uh, my favorite resource at the moment, but there are plenty out there. More digital resources as we get to sketchnoting. So sketchnoting um, is an art therapy concept. It speaks to right brain, left brain crossover, um, is a trauma informed and talks a lot to different pieces of culturally responsive teaching. Um, and with that, so this is a, a digital example. Uh, Sylvia Duckworth is a 
really one of the champions of this. Her manifesto here includes all kinds of um, ideas for introducing this to students um, in a traditional context or virtually. And then again, we have Ditch That Textbook has an entire page filled with different links um, for videos and how to's, again, for both the traditional classroom um, and computer or technology based versions of sketch noting. And again, this process is bringing students from that red down into the orange or yellow and into that green and also helping with right brain left brain crossover, which is um, another key piece of trauma informed care. You can certainly embed that in Padlet as well. Um, or I'm sorry, in Pear Deck as well, as you introduce this concept and then invite students to use sketch noting uh, as part of their lesson. Students, it's almost time to stop watching the slide deck and start drawing your DBT house. Get ready to transition in four minutes. You'll need a piece of paper and a writing utensil. Listen for the transition cue. This slide right here is actually a strategy um, and we will talk about it in just a moment. So here we go. This is our second to last activity. Transition cards speak a lot to permanence and detachment, that last piece of our uh, manifestations of transition shock in the classroom. And so you'll see that I'm very specific in these. I look forward to seeing you on Monday, January 2nd. Sometimes I'll even put a time on there. Um, I use these cards, especially as we're heading into long holidays, long weekends, uh, winter break or spring break. In this context that we are in, these cards are even more impactful, right? So I'll print them out out um, at eight or 16 to a page um, and then I will sign each one by hand for some students I'll make a more personal note here's what these cards are saying I'll give them to each student this is saying I'm not going anywhere when I say I will see you at this time it means I'm waiting here I'm not going anywhere I'm not leaving you I'm not abandoning you we will be here eager to see you when it's time to return so I like these again as we're transitioning into um, a time lapse where I won't see my students students who have a history of transition shock, including trauma, tend to really struggle with gray area. They struggle with ambiguity, with the unknown. And the time that we're living in right now is 100% filled with unknowns, right? For many of us, we don't know if we'll return to school um, in a brick and mortar classroom in the fall. Um, we don't know how a lot of things are going to play out around us right now. So these are, this is a really impactful way to keep um, maintain that structure for students of saying, yes, we are here and we have one area that's solid that you can count on in your life as this community that is our class, right? So again, I usually print those out. Now I do also use them as we transition, not just to um, breaks, but also as we transition from one activity to another. Again, because those students who have experienced adverse life experiences are likely to struggle with ambiguity, I give them some heads up saying, this is going to happen next. So a couple slides back, we said, hey, guess what? In four minutes, we're going to transition. And you had that opportunity to put that in your head. Okay, I'm going to need a paper and pencil in four minutes. Listen for my transition cue. So this is your transition cue. All right, so that just set us up um, to make sure that those students are ready to move on. So here we are at our last activity uh, for this. As you know, you'll need a piece of paper and a pencil. If we were operating in, um, Pear Deck, there's a screen here that you can draw into. We're going to do a DBT house, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. This particular exercise was adapted from uh, my classroom practices or purpose uh, from this book, 101 Mindfulness Exercises. And you can see all of the pieces of culturally responsive learn teaching and learning that this speaks to. And of course, also the trauma informed uh, care. So in that saving face, there were a lot of questions about, gosh, how do I um, know when someone's ready to talk? Or how do I know if there are elements that I need to bring out? Um, the disclaimer, I'm not a, a school counselor or a psychologist or um, anyone that has those types of certifications. So I don't advocate 
digging up traumas that students have. But there are pieces that are helpful for us as teachers or as educators or practitioners to know in creating a trauma-informed environment. So let's see what I'm talking about here. I'm going to ask you on your piece of paper to draw a house. And your house is going to need some elements. So you'll need a door and you'll need a window and you'll need a chimney and you'll need a billboard or sign of some kind. It can be a sign on your roof or perhaps coming out of the window or a sign in your front yard, but some sort of billboard or sign. So again, you have a door and a window and a chimney and a billboard or a sign. If we're operating in Pear Deck, I can just invite students to draw in this space. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. On the foundation, that ground level of your house, I'd like you to write down the values that govern your life. So if I'm talking to a language learner, I might say, write the things that are important to you to be happy, or write the things that are important to you to live a good life, or write the things that are important to you to be a good person. Those are the values that govern your life. And backing up even further, for some of my early, early language learners, those level ones, I might spend a day just labeling the parts of a house. This is the door, this is the window, this is the chimney. And then each day I might do one of these categories. I wouldn't introduce them all at once. For my middle school students, we can whiz through this or high school students can uh, jump on board and we can complete this in um, a, a small block of time. So on the walls of your house, on or in the walls, the people are things that support you, right? The people are things that support you. So the values that govern your life, the people are things that support you, on or in your roof, the people are things that protect you. The people are things that protect you. I'll introduce these slides too, if you are um, just wanting to read those for yourself. On the door, something that you're ashamed of or you're embarrassed of or that you tend to keep hidden from others. Now, a disclaimer here before you, uh, you jump to any conclusions, um, with our early students, they're frequently very um, eager to share this information. Um, I might say something that you're afraid of or something that bothers you or something you don't usually share with other people. Um, for my older students, I just invite them to draw a, a symbol or something that they just have that awareness of. Coming out of the chimney, ways that you blow off steam or get rid of stress. So how do you get rid of that stress? How does that come out? Coming out of the chimney, the ways that you blow off steam. On or in your billboard, something you're proud of that you do want others to see. You want other people to know about you. So something that you're proud of. And then finally in the window, a goal or dream or vision that you have for the future. And so I tend to introduce this activity as we move into the school year a little bit and we've developed some trust. Let's take a look at a few student examples. Before we do that, we just did the simple version. There is an advanced, more intricate version. Um, this works great for high school students. I don't tend to use this because that version we just did um, is enough, especially for the language load for my um, recent arrival populations, but it also gives me all of the information I need to start constructing my trauma-informed space. So when we talk about trauma-informed, we're really thinking about the environment, and that's how it's different than from socio-emotional learning, right? So trauma speaks to um, managing that external environment so that students feel safe learning, where socio-emotional learning focuses on the internal environment and managing that piece, which in turn can, can influence the external environment. But we're working to manage the external environment here. So here's the first thing I noticed. These are my, these are three pretty healthy examples, all different ages in different countries here. The first thing I'm looking for is someone from our school. If it's the janitor, if it's the librarian, if it's the um, PE teacher, if it's the reading coach, someone from our school, either in the protection area or in the walls. If I don't see that, that's my goal for the entire year, right? So that is what I'm looking for first off. Then we're looking at some of these other um, areas for some clues. Uh, Eden here punches pillows and cries when she's stressed out. 
that's pretty natural. Check this out. She's proud of herself. Um, she's embarrassed of her brother who had started a school that year with a physical handicap. And so she was navigating how to address those conversations around um, her brother's condition. But she's also proud of her brother's heart, right? So she has really strong supports with friends and home and shelter and mom. Um, here's another reason I, you can use the templates for this, but I certainly prefer to have students draw their own. This is a student from Uganda and his home reflects his um, home in his native country, right? So he's afraid of bald hair, but he blows off stress by listening to music and singing. He's got family and friends. He's proud of his house. Um, he's got a good support system. So he's dreaming of getting a bike. So this is a pretty healthy looking one. I don't see um, many representatives from the school, so I am focusing on that piece. Same here. This is an eighth grade young lady from Mexico. Great healthy chart with value. She's proud of her writing. She eats candy when she's stressed out. But again, we're working on, she's got teachers here, um, but getting some more staff. Oh, she's got teachers here too. Uh, getting some more uh, specific people that we can um, work to grow that here. So this young lady here is a uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. She's a third grader, was at the time. Um, she's got great value systems, love, friendship, God, Jesus Christ. Um, but she's she's volunteering some information, right? She's saying, hey, Miss Elia for you, when you tell me every day, go home and tell your mom, go home and tell your mom, I need you to know my mom died when I was three years old. I call my stepmom, mom, and my aunt's mom. And on her billboard, she says, I wish people knew that I'm a nice girl. So here was an opportunity to embed some socio-emotional learning and also to work on some areas around trauma and friendship building. Victor, uh, second grader from Mexico. Um, so I see 13 there and I'm thinking, gosh, it's either apartment 13 or there's 13 people living in the home. Um, and the second was true after a home visit. And this was an extremely industrious, hardworking family. What that meant for Victor though, whose, whose bed was near the front of the house, was that his family members were coming and going at all different hours from or to their work. And so we, that was working to move that bed to the rear of the house um, so that we could help um, mitigate some of those areas. An Iraqi student, when we talked in those manifestations, one of those was excessive disorganization, right? And this is this student's everyday life. His locker looks like this, his backpack looks like this. Um, and yes, there's a language issue going on clearly as he's learning that new language, but there's a lot of other stuff going on as well that we were mitigating that within the educational setting. Then we got to this, right? Free homeless house. And that again, after a home visit um, was indeed true. Um, the family had lost their living situation. There were resources available. It was a matter of connecting those uh, folks to resources in their community. Um, if you had a chance to catch Laura Gardner's fabulous presentation last week, she was speaking a lot to those connections and engaging families and making sure that they have connectivity to the resources they need. We have here, this is uh, an eighth grade student. I worked with this student for six months and I was so hard on this poor kiddo. Um, he was falling asleep in class. He was not terribly engaged. I had absolutely no idea he was dealing with significant health problems. Now he has in his door here fat asthma liver problems. His dream is to stop having liver problems. He has in here family, dad, mom, dad. There's no one from the school. He does have one friend listed and erased, but he's also proud of his one friend. So again, working around some trauma and friendship building, trauma does impact the ability to make and maintain valuable friendships. So we were working in that area, working and building up uh, positive relationships with school and working to build that socio-emotional health, right? And the last one we'll look at here, this is a little kiddo from Eritrea. Um, I love the little eyebrows on this house. It has so much character. Um, so he's got his mom coming up repeatedly. And in his roof, he says, my family protect me because the roof explode. Um, and this was a student who was very sensitive. We talked about that uh, external stimuli. So uh, loud boots, unexpected noises, uh, lights turn off 
unexpectedly. I turn on the computer and the, the it makes too much noise. I didn't forgot to turn it off and it comes back on with the volume on, right? So this was a student that I was really working in that trauma-informed environment to make sure that the stimuli that we had going on was manageable for him. The last one here, this is another student from Iraq. This is a high school student, mostly healthy. The one thing that really stood out, he eats to blow off stress. He's got um, good value systems. The one thing that protected him up here was weapons. Um, and coming from his context, this wasn't particularly unusual, but what I wanted this individual to know and understand was that there are lots of things that can protect you, especially in this new context that he's in that have nothing to do with weapons, right? And so I want to build up elements of safety in the classroom, in the school, so that he can fill up that roof with lots of other things that have nothing to do um, with weaponry. So um, I hope that was helpful for you. Um, most of these tools have been addressed at some point in our um, blog series. Again, if you have questions about um, exploring this deeper, we do have one of our online courses digs into this in a really deep way. Uh, that is available um, currently, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I will, in the meantime, turn this back over to Liz so we have a few moments to address some of the questions and thoughts that you might have. This was a ton of information in a short time. Liz, let's see what we can get to with our questions. We have a ton of comments and, and questions, especially about the houses. But first, let me take screen control back here. So as usual, um, we can go back to um, what we are what we have on deck for next week. Before we get to questions, we always like everybody to know what is coming up for our next webinar. We'll be back on live with you on July the 16th, where we are going to have a teacher panel. Now you may recognize these uh, lovely educators. They're going to be joining us to talk about what worked for their students in terms of um, teaching English learners remotely and looking forward uh, to the next school year. We have Maria Montroni Carais, who uh, is a curriculum, uh, a supervisor of curriculum and instruction. We have Katarina Laser and Esther Park. They will be joining us to do a panel discussion of tools, tips, um, suggestions for how to move forward and what worked with their students and what they plan to continue to do uh, with their students should we have to do more virtual teaching in the fall. You can register for this on our website, sdlback.com slash webinar series, or if you are taking part in this webinar right now, you will probably get an email prompting you to register for this, and we hope you will join us. So let's talk now about some of the questions that have come in, Louise. We have quite a few, and I want to address right now the ones that are coming in about the house activity, because that's the most recent one we just did. Mm -hmm. So um, Molly wanted to know, do you model your own example of the house before asking students to do the activity? That's a really great question. I don't because I like to see what populates just without any prompting. Um, so looking at this as an art-based uh, therapy, but also as a tool, I don't want to feed them that information first. I just let them work on this independently. Um, and then I might come back with a student and sit with them and say, can you tell me a little bit more about, about this piece? And a follow-up question to that, are the students sharing their DBT house with other, other students in small group, or is this something done privately and shared only with the teacher? I'm so glad you brought that up. So no, these are done privately. However, there's one piece of the DBT house that I do share with all of the class, and that's the billboard, right? So we make either, um, again, we're talking about that anchor chart. So we make an anchor chart in the classroom of that billboard, all of those things that students want to share with others, that they're proud about, um, those accomplishments or those things they're really great at. If we're in an online context, again, we would we could do that on Google Slides. They could create a slide that represents um, just their billboard piece, or they could introduce that in a Padlet. Or, um, but that's the part that I would share inside the classroom. I use that billboard in an inside-outside circle format. So then we're taking that piece and moving into um, cooperative structures, which speaks to that oral tradition component of culturally responsive teaching and as a best practices for language acquisition, right? So that piece we will share in an inside outside circle in a traditional classroom. 
And this one, again, this um, sort of builds off of the two questions you just answered. Um, any advice or tips that you can share for doing this work with individual students while simultaneously teaching and taking care of the rest of the class? It strikes me as um, you would have to have some sort of small group um, system set up in your class. Um, any, any thoughts you wanted to share around that? Well, for the DBT house, I always do it as a whole group because I don't want students to be singled out in that capacity. So I'm, do, and I will see some DBT houses that are 100% healthy that didn't need to do that. But say we're coming in from um, a disruptive activity, if that is a, perhaps a, um, and when I say disruptive, I mean that in the nicest of ways, we have an unexpected, um, school performance right in the middle of the day which disrupts our schedule and for those students that have a, a trauma informed um a, a trauma influence background would be affected by that so i would use this maybe as a coming down a calming down tool and i would engage the whole class um, and then knowing that i have my eye on certain pieces for other components um i do teach those to the whole class and it takes time at the beginning right in the same way we were talking about the inside outside circle that takes time the quality instructional time to, to teach students how to do that but if you can front load that if you can get that system down then the rest of the year you're saving time because students are able to jump into that um, and know exactly what's expected of them so if i'm teaching say that identify your space i'm taking instructional time out but as students become more um they develop efficacy in doing that and monitoring that for themselves then we're saving classroom time because those students who i would have have to take aside individually to calm them help them calm down myself they are managing that stress on their own um, in a way that is not interrupting the learning at hand we have a question from erica going back to the sos strategy a clarifying question um, she wanted to know if you could review more on what orient orient on one thought means Yes, so um, say uh, Sartu has been in a fight with Yusuf, and so um, now Sartu is, is all kinds of fired up, right? So he just can't seem to move out of that red space. So as he is slowing down, he's counting, he might focus on one thing that makes him really happy. He might think about um, his grandma, who is his favorite person. He might just focus on that one single thought or bring that one image to mind. Or he might think about this awesome art piece that he's so proud that he drew and he'll focus on that. Um, and he'll maintain that thought and try his best to shut everything out with that orientation on one, one positive thought. Thank you. I wanted to jump now to our viewers who work with adults because we have quite a few who work with adults and we had some specific questions um, not only come in during your presentation, but that came in for the pre-registration questions too. So when we're talking about working with adults, um, what are the best ways instructors can assess when and if adult students are ready to talk about traumatic past experiences? So again, when we go back to that part, I said, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a psychologist, I would never advocate unless you do have those tools in your tool belt, and I don't. Um, I would never advocate um, going about the work of digging those up, um, because we're not, most of us, um, trained to, to handle that. So, and in another way too, that also brings that that trauma and that stress onto us is, and brings in a vicarious trauma and secondary trauma piece, right? So um, things like the DBT house are revealing in the sense that, um, say my little one from Democratic Republic of Congo that had some information she needed to volunteer, she needed to express. And that was a safe space in that saving space capacity that she could do that. Um, also, the worry boxes, Setting those up is a great tool for adults as well if they are ready to share that worry. And I like that in that case, it's not always face to face. So if I'm not um, prepared to handle that worry, I can converse with that person and say, listen, this is a big worry and I'm glad you shared it with me and let's find the right people to help manage this worry. Are you willing to do that with me? Thank you. Um, there is another question that came in as a pre-registration question that I think is probably on everybody's minds, and that is, um, in light of recent events, um, what unique responses do you think we can 
expect when we when we um, come back with our students um, specifically. So we will see. Gosh, there's a lot of that going on, right? So. Um, First of all, we will have that cultural aspect. We will undoubtedly see some implications related to race-based trauma. We will see some implications related to historical trauma, where for many of our community members, um, that trauma, um, including race-based trauma, has been passed down intergenerationally. And so we will see kind of the manifestation of that. Um, in all of these, we focused on that cultural piece because instructionally, that's, that's where we are and that's our responsibility. But any of the strategies that we use can be applied to help mitigate trauma across any of those other um, intersections. Students will um, almost certainly have more than one. That's why we call it the intersectionality. They may have race-based trauma and the cultural influence and intergenerational trauma and there's gender um, implications for that. Um, so we will see that. Again, we go back to that idea that students who have um, experienced adverse life experiences struggle a lot with ambiguity or with that gray area or with the unknown. So the best thing we can do is create as many knowns as we can. So scheduling is important. Um, trying our best to stay with a schedule as we think about um, how we're setting up our classes for the fall. It's a really challenging time, if, especially if we're working virtually, to maintain a schedule. But trying to remain as predictable as possible can help mitigate that. And that's really one of the first steps in that non-negotiable five. Um, we just had a question come in, and I think you actually addressed it um, just now toward the tail end of your um, response there. But um, Claire wanted you to talk a little bit more about building enough trust with a newcomer that they are willing to be this vulnerable and share this personal information through the DBT house activities and some of the other ones. And from what I hear you saying, I think it's part, you know, part of establishing um, that routine is, is a key part of it. But did you want to speak to some other, um, some other things that um, work toward developing that relationship that then allows some of this work to occur? Absolutely. So again, um, trauma we can look at as managing that external environment where socio-emotional learning looks to more of the inside, the internal um, environment and managing that piece. So all that we can do to manage that external area, which is really, especially in the virtual context, more and more out of our hands, right? So in this case, um, bringing those parents on board is a super critical part. Uh, the tools and resources, again, I would point folks to um, inner world work. They're mostly um, made for home. Um, and going back again and listening to some of what Laura Gardner shared about engaging those families, um, that that piece will be really, really critical in the coming year because it's not just the student we're building that trust with, right? It's the whole family. And that cultural aspect goes far beyond the student. So in some cases, that student might be ready, but because of, say, the saving face or the collectivist nature that, um, as Geneva Gay puts it, our outgoing messages are not being received through the, the student's cultural reference points and making sure that we're engaging the families in that piece as well. Louise, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this information. We do have a lot more questions that are coming in, but as usual, we uh, do our best to get to these offline via email. So if you uh, have an, a, a question that's lingering that we didn't get to, uh, look for an email from us as we always like to make sure that uh, your questions have been answered. Um, we always like to close out, of course, with a big thank you to our presenter and to you, our viewers, for taking this time um, to, and spending it with us today. Uh, and just a reminder of where you can find Saddleback. Um, you can find us on whatever your preferred social media site is. We are there. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, we are there. Find us, follow us, say hello. We always love to hear from you. And should you need information about Saddleback products and materials, you can uh, go to our website, sdlback.com, or give us a call or an email. We're always happy to help you. Uh, and once again, a big thank you to you for spending this time. Many of you are on summer break, but you're working hard to further your own professional learning so that you can help your students um, in the fall when they return. So thank you very much. We hope to see you again on our next webinar. And Louise, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all of this, these great strategies. We really appreciate you.
Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you, Saddleback. And again, thank you to all of you, view you viewers for all that you do for our students and for being here with us today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, we'll see everybody. you next time.